Okay, let's begin with uh, module two. Module two covers three more chapters. Uh, it also has a module two re lecture review, just like last week, where you'll have about three questions or four questions per chapter. And another net lab assignment where you'll do a couple more labs and a quiz at the end of the module. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in the chat, either on Discord or Zoom. Uh, it is easier. I would suggest doing, doing the chat on Discord, only because that's where it can stay saved and, and anyone can see uh, what happened. But let's begin with chapter four, managing disks and file systems. Uh, so Windows can handle various types of disks. Uh, the two main ways that Windows handles it is, are they connected to me physically or are they presented to me? And that can be either an external or internal disk or a virtual disk or multiple disks connected as one. The internal disk is the most uh, conventional, traditional, the one that's physically connected to the system via cable. So like a solid state drive or like a spinning disk or even a disk that's connected uh, through the PCI. Your externals are, the, are you know, your typical things like USB or eSATA, wireless, Thunderbolt. They're still a part of the system, but they are easily removable. Ideally, you don't want operating systems running off of an external drive just because it'll be slower to connect. And the last thing you really want is a drive that you're running the operating system on to be accidentally disconnected and corrupt a whole lot of stuff. A virtual disk is really, so you can think of a virtual disk like a zip file. I mean, it's, it's just a file that is pretending to be a hard drive. Uh, Windows natively supports Microsoft's own standard of VHD. The other big standard that's around is VMware. And uh, Microsoft can't, or Windows doesn't necessarily handle VMware's disk uh, natively, but it will VHD. A logical disk uh, can be combined with multiple to be to make one large disk, kind of like a RAID array. Um, I always have some problems with uh, with a software RAID because if if the operating system ever does get corrupted, then the hard the software RAID is lost. Versus if it's a hardware RAID and something happens to the operating system, it doesn't affect the array. So my, my two cents are though it is possible to create arrays through the software, I think it's safer to do it via hardware. There are two main partition styles that exist. It's either the master boot record, which is the old, and the GPT, which is the new. MBR has been around for quite some time. It is uh, the older of the two. It is where the operating system normally resides. Uh, it can handle disks up to two terabytes in size, whereas a GPT can handle disks larger than two terabytes and is bootable as long as the BIOS is an updated UEFI. So if, if you have a drive that it is a GPT partitioned, but is connected to a old bio system, it may not boot. Uh, the two have to match with each other in order to boot. So disks can be arranged as either a basic disk, a dynamic disk, or storage spaces and we'll cover what these three mean in just a bit. 
So our basic disk, uh, it is NBR style. All its space can be organized into one or more uh, partitions. And those are stored in the, basically what's considered as the table of contents. A dynamic disk can be either a master boot record or GPT. Uh, they can handle more, they can handle more partitions than MBR. MBR has a limit of four, whereas GPT does not have that limit. Uh, the, instead of being called partitions, they're more or less called volumes. Uh, it is possible to boot off of a dynamic disk. At the time of this writing uh, for the, the textbook, it was not possible to really boot from it, but now it is possible as long as the operating system is 64-bit and the BIOS is UEFI, it is completely possible to boot from a dynamic disk. So don't let this slide uh, mislead you. Storage spaces is, um, is actually a, a bit of a problem. Uh, in the last update to Windows 10, and I'll put this link in the links reference for you. There, and here I'll, I'll show it to you here. This was August 3rd of this year. So this is not old at all. Uh, there was a bug that corrupted storage spaces. And like I was saying about software versus hardware, this is a software solution. And because it's software, it will have its problems and it is possible to break it because it's running from the operating system. Now that is not to say hardware doesn't have the same problem either. It's just not as easy to break a hardware RAID versus a software RAID. But anywho, storage spaces is an inexpensive way to combine multiple disks together using the operating system. It came about in 2012. Uh, yes, it is less expensive because you're using software to do the RAID function versus pay, uh, buying a RAID controller. But like this article that I found from, uh, from the 3rd of August, it, you, know, you pay. You pay for it one way or another. So it combines disks to put them into a storage pool and that storage pool is the representation of all the disks together. Uh, once the disks are assigned to the pool, then storage spaces in general can access it. It can work with a variety of disks because it is software-based. So in hardware-based RAID, the disks need to be the same size or, uh, or the RAID will be created to whatever the smallest disk is, you know, it, it has that limitation and you don't necessarily have that limitation with software, you know, but you might run into the problems like the one I just showed you. Pros and cons to everything. Uh, you can hot swap disks as needed because it's all software based. You can over provision or over allocate space. So if you have, you know, you could create a pool of 900 gigabytes, but really only have 500 gigabytes of physical disk. So you have 400 gigs that uh, will either get, uh, that, that Windows has to figure out, okay, either we're gonna get rid of some data or we're gonna save less into the pool. We have to figure something out. So you can, you can fiddle around with the numbers because again, it's all software based. It's not hardware based. If you don't have a way to do backups, if you don't have a failover, just like in hardware, things can get corrupted. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask in either the Discord or Zoom. Um, 
This moves on from storage spaces into the disk management tools. And these are the native tools that you have in Windows. Uh, so the two big ones are disk management and disk part, one being GUI based, one being text based. The disk management console, you will see if you run computer management or you could call it by itself. It is your graphical user interface. It is like Gparted uh, for Linux where you can take effects on drives automatically. This is what it looks like. It's pretty much it looked the same ever since it came about forever and a day ago. Where you can see the drives that are connected to it and you see the, uh, the partitions that exist and what kind of a disk is it? Is it a basic disk or dynamic? Is it a, a um, optical drive? This part is its partner who is command line based. So great for things like scheduling tasks or uh, having an action done without a GUI. This is what it looks like when you run this part. The menu will change for a little bit and you can run certain commands within this part. Kind of like if you're running Metasploitable or Metasploit, you'll so you'll see that, or if you're running a, a Python-based program, the, um, the command line changes. Um, your physical disks, the two big things that you'll need to do is, is installing and replacing them. When you add a new disk to any operating system, whether Windows or not, they all need to be prepared because they come in blank. Um, a basic disk in Windows can be moved from one computer to another and will stay a basic disk, whereas a dynamic disk uh, has to be changed. Because the, the whole dynamic uh, situation works within that operating system. So when you move it from one computer to another, it has to basically be updated and changed, whereas basic applies to any because basic was the first type of drive that was built into Windows. So it is very much backwards compatible. Any disk that it does not recognize will show up as foreign. So if you connect a uh, drive that was formatted to Mac OS, it's going to look like a foreign disk or formatted XTFS3. For Linux, it'll come, it'll show up as foreign, so you'll need to import it and or reformat in order for Windows to be able to read and write to it. Uh, when we're talking about storage spaces, if you're moving the entire uh, set over, then the whole pool should be moved. There shouldn't just be one, uh, one disk. It should, the whole set should be moved over. Like I said, when you're getting a new disk in, uh, now this stuff is, happens automatically. As soon as you connect something, it starts looking uh, for the hardware change. It'll scan the disk and it'll tell you, hey, we need to initialize a said disk. Now, the device manager is normally the one who handles this kind of stuff, but you can also do it through the computer management. Any new disks are not seen immediately by Windows. So you have to uh, force the manual recheck and go through that process. Once they're initialized, now they can be used. Otherwise, Windows can't touch them and, and do anything with them. Again, if you're in disk management, you will get a little pop-up that'll tell you this disk needs to get initialized, let's begin. When it comes to virtual disks, it can pretty much do the same thing of creating the disk, attaching and detaching while the system is running, especially because it's software based. A VHD can exist as a single file, which generally is easiest to have as a single file. 
you do have to specify where it is, its size, its format, and its type when you create it. Once it's attached, it will look and act just like a physical disk. And just because uh, you create a virtual disk of 500 gigabytes, but your physical disk really only has 100, it doesn't mean you can store 500 gigabytes. It's going to crash. Because the, the virtual is just a number. You know, the physical actually matters. Uh, it is easy to un or dismount a virtual disk because again, it's basically a, a zip file. You, uh, most most easily like a right click method really to uh, detach a VHD, and then you can move that file around as needed, reattaching to another machine and accessing it like a USB drive and moving on. Uh, the storage spaces view can help you administer and, and uh, control your storage spaces. That is where you need to go to initialize storage spaces if you are to use it. This is what it looks like. It's in the control panel under system and security. Once a pool is created like this pool, this example pool, you see it's 10 gigabytes and it's using 768 megabytes to start or it's a 4.25 capacity using one one gig i was reading the uh the thing about uh, under it uh once it's all done and working then you can either rename it you can add this to it you can optimize so on and so forth It does handle some fault tolerance, which is good. But again, if, if uh, there is a problem within the OS, that may uh, mess with the entire fault tolerance. Here are some of the resiliencies that exist within storage spaces, which is great. You have a two-way mirror, or a three-way mirror, or even a parity. Um, but if there's a bug like there was in, in August that corrupts the whole thing, then yikes. These are the file systems that Windows recognizes. FAT, which is the oldest, NTFS, the second oldest, ReFS, the new one, and UDF, which is used for optical disks. Like I said, FAT has been around since MS-DOS in the 80s and is still used today. Uh, the three that exist are FAT, FAT32, and XFAT, with XFAT being the one that can handle larger files. Uh, if you're ever copying data into a USB stick and the, let's say the file that you're copying over is more than four gigabytes big, and when it reaches about that point, it stops, and it tells you that there's a problem and you're like, what is happening? It's because it was formatted in FAT. Because FAT cannot allocate uh, more than four gigabytes for a single file. Nowadays, you should not be using FAT as, your, as the file system for your operating system, uh, namely because of its file size limitations about because how old it is and it provides no file system security whatsoever. Ideally, you should only use FAT in a USB drive or you know, something small like that or like an SD card on your phone, but it should not be your main uh, file system. NTFS came about in the early 2000s when NT came. Uh, it has not changed much in the 20 years since it's been around, which is, which is a problem. Uh, Windows 
pretty much solely runs on NTFS and with not much changes in 20 years since its existence, it means that the, all the security checks that have been put in place have been breached, have been figured out, have been cracked. So looking at NTFS itself, it does things like log file and checkpoint. It does alternate data streams. It does encrypting file system. And that came about when like XP uh, came, to, came to existence. Uh, and uh, it does do file and folder permissions, whereas FAT didn't do any of that. It does do compression. You can also do things like disk quotas and symbolic links, all stuff that you can already do in the Linux OS, uh, you can do with an NTFS. Disk quotas can be useful if we're dealing with a server and many users, you can limit how much they can save. And uh, the OS can automatically issue warnings to the whatever user is eating up a lot of space. Here is a picture of the quota entries. You can mount empty folders in an NTFS partition system. And you would do that through the disk management console, kind of like mounting a VHD file, but instead of a VHD file, it's a folder and you can point to a file or folder located somewhere else. Now I see a question of what are the different types layouts of layouts? Oh, what are the different types of file systems? I mean, there's a lot of different types of file systems, uh, but the four that Windows C's are, are FAT, NTFS, REFS, and UDF. Anything else, it, you have to install a program in order to read. Like if you want to read a, a APFS uh, Apple file system, you have to install a program. Or if you, if you want to read Linux file systems, you have to install a program into Windows in order for it to read. And sometimes it can just read and not be able to write. Uh, symbolic links are great because you may not have to uh, show the exact location of where something is stored. This is good when we're, we need to share information and it may, you know, if we have any fear that it might fall in the wrong hands, they won't be able to access where the actual data is. We can, we can cut off their access without affecting the actual data itself. REFS, if you've never heard of REFS, I'll put a link in our links reference overview. It is newer than NTFS. And from reading the overview, reading some documentation, it looks like they're looking to eventually replace NTFS with REFS. It's not quite there yet, though. So for example, things like file and folder compression, disk quotas, and EFS don't exist in, NT in um, our EFS. You also can't boot to an REFS uh, system. You can mount it, but you can't boot from it. And like I said, UDF is, is what you typically see in um, in an optical disc and it can read and write as long as the, the DVD or the, you know, the optical drive can write uh, to a disc. Some of the common file system changes that you would do on a system are like changing the assigned drive letter or uh, converting the installed file system that exists. The drive letters are assigned alphabetically 
by tradition, A and B are given over to a floppy, and that's why they're not automatically assigned. Uh, C, D, and E tend to be, or C tends to be the one for the, the internal drive, and then D forward for opticals and anything else that uh, follows. You can always change those letters. They are not at all um, permanent to a system. Like I said, you can convert uh, between these, the, the main three that Windows uses. Just remember that if you go from FAT to NTFS or to VFS, you're gonna lose, you're gonna gain and lose some stuff. And in the conversion, you ideally don't want to keep any data there. You want a clean slate. Um, partitions can be cut. So there is a question in the chat. Uh, why does a partition of a drive become unhealthy? Um, yeah, that could be either the, the hardware itself is dying. Uh, it could be that there is a lot of corruption within the disk. Uh, all, the, all the Windows file systems get fragmented where data from one file is stored in one place and saved in another. So when a file is read, all those pieces have to be brought back together in order to be read, which is why you have to defragment. Um, it's not so much a problem with like an SSD because it, it reads and writes quickly. But that, that does end up leading to file corruption later and causing the, the disk itself to become unhealthy. But normally corruption is the, the number one reason why it's showing up as unhealthy. Uh, you can also convert disks through the command line that has been around as long as you have full admin access. All the major file systems that Windows uses has attributes. And you can see these attributes in the file explorer when you hit the properties. Those attributes are down at the bottom. In this picture, this file has attributes of either read only or hidden. And then there's an advanced button that can see a little more. Which are these? You can archive. Uh, this file can be indexed. We can compress or encrypt it. If you choose to encrypt a folder, then does this apply to just the folder or the folder and the contents within it? Those are two different things. Uh, so the flags, which are the items you just saw earlier, they control what, what can the operating system do with this data? So if the read only is turned on, then we can't make any changes. If the archive is, bit is set, then whenever we do backups, it can get uh, backed up or indicate, hey, this file needs to get backed up. Um, if it's hidden, then it won't be seen by uh, users and you'll have to unhide it in order to see it or use like the folder, um, the folder option to show hidden files. If you set it to system, then it's only viewed by the operating system and not by uh, users and groups. There is an option in the folder settings to view system files and you'll see like files even in your main drive that you didn't know existed but were there that are only accessible to the system itself. Compression is just like, um, just like anything else. NTFS has its own built-in compression system. When you copy a compressed file, it will grow back up to its uh, normal size because the drive you're copying to may not have the same compression setting as the one where it came from. Encryption, again, supported by NTFS only at this time. 
it is normally set by the security key of the user. This is why it's important in a business environment, if you're using encryption, that you do not delete the user from your Active Directory. If you, if you have enabled encryption at, at your organization and a user encrypts their, their data uh, on Windows and they quit or they leave or they move on, you should disable the account so they, they can't log in again to make any changes. But once they're gone, you can reset that password to something you know as the admin, log in as that user and be able to access the files. The last thing you want to do is when a employee leaves, that you delete that, that account and now they, uh, they encrypted this data and now you have to spend more time trying to break it than just being able to get in, access the data and move on. You wanna save yourself that pain. So whenever you're dealing with users and someone is leaving, make sure that you disable not delete the account. At least delete it once you have everything out and you've done anything, anything compliant related and it's okay to do so. Otherwise, just disable the account so nobody can use it. You can use access control lists to really use a fine-grained approach as to who can access what data and how. These are great as we deal with sensitive information. Uh, the default permissions you can see are on the root folder or the C drive in Windows. And then those apply out to the rest of the, uh, the hard drive. Anybody who's an administrator has full control. Uh, the operating system has full control as well. Users can read and execute programs, and then authenticated users, which is different from just any other user, can create folders in the, the C drive and create files written, uh, create files and write them in subfolders, not in the main folder. That's your default permissions. That doesn't mean keep them, but you know where you start from so if you're trying to meet compliance, you'd know that this needs to change. Or if you're trying to harden your system, you know that this needs to change as well. So here is the look at the security for the C drive. On a typical system, again, you should, you should not keep the default settings. You should adjust as needed. Um, like I said, the default permissions, admins can do anything and everything. Felt like I went backwards, but no, that is the default. Um, these are the default settings and they probably shouldn't stay. These additional folders that are created will inherit the permissions from the parent. And if you feel, or to me compliance, uh, if you see that these are inadequate, then those should be changed. When you assign permissions, they can be set in either the NTFS standard or individual, but inheritance does happen. Here are the predetermined list of NTFS permissions that you can read about from a write, read, list the contents, read and execute, modify, full control, and special. Individually, you can say this specific user can do these things. And here's a list of uh, all the advanced permissions that you see in an NTFS uh, uh, partition drive. So you have a couple of options when we talk about permission scope. Oh, is it limited to just the one file we're talking about? 
or does it include the folder that we're talking about and not the files within it? And you know, you have you have all these options on how does the the permissions that we're creating how does how does it affect the data that we're working with? Again, they apply the permissions apply to the first folder and where they're used, and then it propagates out. You can block inheritance so that it just applies to the folder but not the files. This can get muddy, especially if you make any mistake and you lose access to the file. It, you might spend some time reorganizing uh, the permissions afterwards. Uh, some ways that you can uh, see what the permissions will do is through effective permissions to see the results before you actually apply them. So if you're thinking of, let me change these settings, what is it going to look like for the guest? And then uh, Windows will tell you, well, this is what it will look like for them. In this case, they won't have full control. They won't be able to change permission or take ownership, but they'll be able to do everything else. So you can see it before it takes effect. Every file and folder has an owner. That is the user who can assign permissions. Be careful when changing the owner because it may prevent you from making changes later on. Depending on the target location where you're copying, some of these permissions will stay or some of them will go away. For example, if you're moving from FAT, or sorry, from NTFS to FAT, all the permissions go away. If you're copying from one NTFS system to another NTFS system, uh, some of them may stay, some of them may no longer work because the user doesn't exist in the target system. This can get tricky. But again, when, uh, when you need to manage file system permission, remember that admins have full control. Users have control to their own profiles. And users should not be able to edit other users. Any questions? Cool. So I will stop this recording.